Um, I'm Scott Belcher. I'm the President and CEO of the Intelligent Transportation Society of America. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all to the second installment of our regional workshop series um, focusing on smart uh, parking. I'd uh, like to thank our hosts. Without them, this would not have uh, been possible. ITS California, represented by Brian Burkhardt. Where are you, Brian? I didn't see you. I still can't see you. Okay. Uh, Caltrans is represented by uh, Matt uh, Hansen, uh, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, uh, represented by Melanie Crotty and Carol Kuster, and then the Green Parking Council, represented by its board chair, John Schmidt. Uh, thank you all for your time and for your support. I'd also like to thank the sponsors. Um, we've got 12 of them, 12 companies in the lobby who you can talk to about new, innovative, cool technology. Um, and so make sure you visit with them. Uh, they're the ones who are, who are really driving the changes that, um, that Professor Shoup uh, envisioned. And, is, and we're, we're really seeing that happen today. And, and it's companies that are out there that are doing this. You have seen them flashing before your eyes. And then fi finally, I'd like to thank um, the organizing committee, but particularly our chair, Susan Shaheen. Uh, Susan's a great thinker, a great leader, and, and a, somebody I, I consider a friend. And Susan, I know you're doing this while you're trying to raise a couple of kids, teach a few classes, and run a center. Thank you. Um, so this is, this, this, is, this is really rocks. I mean, we, we did this. Um, we, try, we decided we would try... Uh, to do something different this year. Um, one of the problems that, that happens in, uh, with transportation events these days is that public sector people have a hard time traveling. There are travel bans and then there are budget cuts. And so we do these big events and, and get one or two people, but not necessarily the, 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 the people we want. Um, and so we decided that if we couldn't if, if the mountain wouldn't come to Muhammad, we'd bring the mountain. If the, yeah, if, if Muhammad wouldn't come to the mountain, we'd bring the mountain to Muhammad. And we've done these regionally focused, technology-driven, um, practical meetings. And we did the first one out in Jersey City um, in December. It was, it was uh, I think, a real success. And then this one, we've got over 150 registered, and, and I know we've got another 15 walk-ins so far, and we have to cap it at 175. And I think that's actually a pretty good number. I don't want to get much bigger than this because the value of this meeting is, you know, hearing the thought leaders that you're going to hear, giving you a sense of what you can do in your communities, how you can deploy what works, how you can finance it. But the, the greater value is to spend the time talking and networking during the breaks and finding out people that you want to work with, that you want to, you want to think um, important thoughts about. And we've got folks that are deploying. We've got folks that are academics and thinking. We've got uh, banks that are here that are looking to monetize. And so I think you've got a really good, robust uh, mix of uh, professionals. And we'll talk about everything from demand-based pr demand pricing, mobile payment systems, advanced metering and occupancy sensors, truck parking. Uh, so the whole spectrum. Um, it'll be an intense day and a half, um, but for those of you who are new to this, you'll get it, uh, a, real, a real intense course on and what smart parking's all about. So ITS America, we're the largest uh, transportation technology association. Uh, the folks who are part of ITS America are focused on using transportation to solve, or using technology to solve transportation problems. And that's how we ended up in this space, um, like, like the other spaces we're in, not because technology is the only solution to parking, um, but it can certainly, um, it can certainly uh, make a difference. ITS America is comprised of, um, of public uh, leaders, cities, states, DOTs, transit organizations, universities, and private companies that range uh, from the interesting and cool startup companies, uh, some of whom you'll see here today, um, to the big companies uh, like IBM, Verizon, um, General Motors. But again, the, the common goal is, is to use technology uh, to, uh, to solve transportation problems, to improve safety, efficiency, sustainability, and competitiveness. So if you're not a member of ITS America, you should become a member of ITS America. We need you. Uh, we're only as effective as our membership. 
Uh, and we do everything from hosting these kinds of events, but we're also um, spend an awful lot of time pushing and educating Congress, state legislatures, and we need membership because you guys matter. You guys vote. You, you talk to your, your congressmen. So, and if you're not a member of the Green Parking Council and you're an operator, you should be. They're doing great things in really pushing parking um, and parking operations to a new level. And if you're not a member of ITS California, shame on you. You should all be members of ITS California. There's no excuse. You're here. Um, and ITS California has a booth, and um, and there are a lot. Uh, I know I know many of you are members of ITS California. Those of you who are not, go go by and talk to them. Also talk to Jen Harrison, who's outside. She's the lady who helped you. She she can help you with ITS America. If you like this event, come to Nashville next month. We do our annual meeting, um, and. So what, what you see here is practical technology solutions around parking. In Nashville, you'll see it around car share and connected vehicles and mileage-based user fees. So you take this and, and ramp it up about 10 times, and you see what you get in, um, in Nashville. Um, we'll also be doing something similar um, uh, in Chicago in August on smart streets. So some parking, but we're going to expand the aperture a little bit talk a little bit more about bus rapid transit, signal priority, um, bike share programs, the things that are making urban centers more livable and, um, and the way that technology fits into that. Uh, there's information on all of these things at the front, um, at the front desk. The other thing that's at the front desk, um, so now we'll come back to parking. I've, I've done my, uh, my advertisement. Um, the, the other thing that you'll see at the front desk that you should get if you haven't already gotten it is the study that we've done on uh, smart parking. We have a research group that does market data studies, does technology studies for different, different groups, sometimes for investors, sometimes for um, uh, the U.S. government or state government, sometimes for private companies. Um, and so we, we've done one on smart parking, uh, kind of looking at where, the tech, where technology is today and where it's going. Uh, it's free, so uh, if you haven't seen it, pick one up. If there are none left, you can go to our website and, um, and get a copy of it. It looks at the opportunities and challenges that we're facing with parking technology today. Um, so the plan is we go to 545 today, um, and then uh, we'll have a really great reception. Um, you know, I've been, Susan hosts meetings here regularly. It's a pretty nice place. If you don't know the history, it's like LED, Diamond. I don't even know if there is one, but it's it's yeah okay. I I, I know what platinum. Is. I'm trying to do even better than platinum. Um, so it, it is it is really um, a, a remarkable building, uh, and the um, uh, the caterers who will be here are um, you know are uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Susan? You know, they, organic and they you know it's it's what you would expect, um, and there's really good wine. So. So stick around. Um, tomorrow we'll be back here again at 8.30, and we'll wrap up at around 3.30. So again, like I said, it's a fairly um, intense uh, two days, but it'll be fun. We'll have, we'll have some fun, and hopefully, hopefully we'll have an opportunity for you to engage with our speakers. And if, we, if Susan's done her job, there'll be a little controversy, and maybe people will argue a bit, and it'll make it even more exciting. So we're going to start out locally. We're going to start out here in Berkeley. Um, Berkeley's a mid-sized city, but with a, uh, a, a you know pretty good university. Uh, a lot of folks here, um, and so it has a unique set of parking issues. And so we're really lucky to have our first speaker, uh, Danette Perry, who's a certified administrator of public parking, with over 24 years in parking. Uh, she does both on-street and off-street parking for, for the city of Berkeley, and so you can imagine some of the challenges that, uh, that she's faced and that she's going to tell us about. Um, one of the most interesting things about her, um, and if you get a chance to talk to her at the break, ask her about her musical career, um, because uh, we all have our, our hidden lives, and uh, I was lucky enough to hear a little bit about, um, about hers. So with more, please come up and join us then. Good afternoon.
afternoon, and I'd like to just reaffirm what Scott said. I am Danette Perry. I'm the Parking Services Manager here at the City of Berkeley, and I must say I am truly delighted to stand here today and to extend on behalf of Mayor Tom Bates and our city officials and myself a very warm City of Berkeley welcome to ITS America as well as each of you here today. Now, I, I'd just like to ask, maybe by show of hands, is there anyone visiting Berkeley for the first time? Yes! <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And special welcomes to you all. Because of you, I get to do my Berkeley spiel. <laughs> and uh, excuse my manners, for those of you who are not first timers, let me say welcome back to Berkeley. We appreciate it. But you know, as I think about it, and it may be a bit ironic, for those of you who are not first timers here in Berkeley, and you're here in Berkeley attending a parking, a smart parking symposium, uh, you're in Berkeley again, so it may be something like your repeat offenders to Berkeley visitation or something. And it's like, well, well, I just made that up, but bear with me because I'm a parking professional. So when I put on my parking cap and I think about repeat offenders, and then I say, okay, like scoff law, and it's like, okay, parking, smart technology. In the city, we run a very successful uh, license plate recognition booting and enforcement program. So it's like, wouldn't it be a gas if we took some of that new technology? And for all of you who drove in today, we could just boot your cars and then just charge you a fee to take them off. And it's like, talk about a welcome to Berkeley that stands out. <laughs> Please excuse me. I, it's a parking thing. I get excited. I get wrapped up. I'm just joking. I promise we won't boot any vehicles for attendees at the conference here today. That is, unless, of course, you're not driving any vehicles with five or more outstanding citations more than 30 days old. And I saw your eyebrows rise up there. Don't blame me, it's the law. On a more serious note, for any of you who've had an opportunity or not, to review the agenda going on for the next day and a half. There are some really dynamic speakers, panelists, and discussion topics for which I'm sure they're going to provide some provo provocative thought thinking uh, insight as well as probably some innovative solutions to you. I'd like to take a moment to thank ITS America as well as the co-host ITS California, Caltrans, MTCA, and the Green Parking Conference for bringing the SMART Symposium back to the West Coast and making the um, intelligent decision to hold it in Berkeley here at the platinum-rated David Brower Center. So we are a small city with a really big reputation. Free speech, need I say more? With 113,000 in our population, Berkeley is a destination. We have an array of restaurants, shops, uh, cultural institutions, and special events. And of course we are home to the university. So for most of you repeat offenders out there, you're probably saying, okay, I already knew that. So I'd like to step back and take a turn here and tell you about something that's very near and dear to my heart. As a matter of fact, I've spent over 25 years, or the last 25 years, keeping this very close to me, either in my, my uh, job title or in my uh, resumes. That would be parking, did you guess? So, city facilities. On street, just over 3,700 spaces, controlled by pay and display machines and single space meters. Off street, the city has three parking garages, 
with a total of just over 950 spaces. We also add a couple of small surface lots and we call ourselves a city. A great one at that. Our parking operators, private, they add about 1,200 uh, public parking spaces and the university has a little over 3,400 spaces that are available for public parking most nights and weekends. Gross revenue from parking meters, last year, 6.2 million. Parking fines, 8.7 million. Off-street garages, just under 3.6 million. Now, Berkeley, like most cities, large and small, we have our challenges as it relates to parking on street and off street. Not all of our parking meters accept credit card payments. In our high demand blocks, particularly in the downtown core, we're oversubscribed, while the low demand blocks are highly underutilized. Now, mostly due to um, requests from the community, our parking time limits from block to block, they vary. Off street, we need better guidance to our parking locations, and the public needs a better understanding to find parking availability. Now, for some of you who drove in, you may have parked in the garage beneath this facility. It's shown here as its interest, in, entrance on this slide. Unfortunately for me, it's one of the best kept secrets in Berkeley. So based on these issues and some others, we came up with a marketing concept and we called it Go Berkeley. And we established some goals for a transportation demand management and parking pilot. Now, what we want to do is encourage folks to take some alternative transportation modes to change the parking conditions so the vehicles aren't circling around or double parking frequently. We want to improve upon our parking customer service. And then most importantly, we like to create a long-term parking management system for the city of Berkeley. Now, just as the larger cities do, we applied for grants and we were funded, receiving three federal grants. Now, even with our big reputation, we're not the metropolis like San Francisco and LA, DC, New York. We're just the small to mid-sized city, like most throughout the country. So Berkeley received these grants to serve as a model for small to medium-sized cities uh, with limited resources that want to implement a demand-based program. The Berkeley, our City of Berkeley pilot, it'll be widely talked about by the FWHA. We're hoping to prove that a city our size can do this. Go Berkeley. Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Now our pilot timeline began in June of last year and it should conclude in the spring of 2015. Currently we're gathering uh, manual data and we're performing some uh, public outreach. A lot of public outreach. We're making some progress as we're converting our meters to accept credit card payments and we expect that our first parking changes will take place this fall. Now here's the real key to making this pilot a success. In the spring, May or June, we'll be releasing an RFP that's seeking new technology for performing automated data collection as well as enforcement. Now, Berkeley, as a model city, model city, is hoping to show 
that you can continue to repetitively collect data. A city our size, we can't afford to do it if we have to do it manually each time. We, we just don't have those resources. So, what we hope to do is that the RFP will show with a few tweaks to the technology that we can accomplish three things. To leverage our existing resources to collect parking data, perhaps by our parking meters. Two, is to be able to share our resources with other city departments, like the police department parking enforcement units. And three, have a cost-effective solution that's usable every day by our city staff. Now shown here, it's our pilot area. It includes the downtown and also what we call the south side. It's the surrounding area for the UC campus. Additionally, we have a very well-established retail community called the Elmwood. We know where we want to go to manage Berkeley's parking and to be a model city throughout the country for cities our size. By price, shifting the demand to the blocks and locations with available spaces. by time limits, shorter limits in the desirable spaces, and longer limits in those that are available, perhaps a little bit further out. And by driver information, be it website, a mobile app, or just the static signage. This is where we want to go, so stay tuned to go Berkeley. We believe that we can make this pilot a success. And perhaps for all we know, you may be involved with making us get to that victory. I'd like to just take a moment and ask to show their hands. I have a couple of team members from Go Berkeley here today. So if there are any questions or any of you may have, we'll be around. It's Matt Nichols, Transportation Principal Planner, and Willa E. She is transportation planner as well as the uh, project manager for Go Berkeley. So as it's time to move forward to the first session of this Smart Parking Symposium, I'd like to say to all of you newcomers as well as you repeat offenders, I hope you benefit from things that are discussed at the Smart Parking Symposium. Enjoy your time in our city. And remember, go Berkeley. Thank you, Danette. Now, um, for all of you who are here that can help Berkeley solve its parking problems, raise your hands too. They, okay, so look around. You got, you got some, some people here who can help you out. They'll be talking to you. Don't worry. You'll be, you'll be like a bee with honey. All right, so now um, we have a really a, a special opportunity uh, to, um, to hear from uh, what somebody that the Wall Street Journal has called a parking rock star. Um, and also called the Yoga of Urban Planning, uh, uh, Professor Donald Shoup. He's a re renowned parking expert and the author of The High Cost of Free Parking. And many of you, I'm sure, have read that book and have got it. In, in, and um, you know that it's really driven a lot, driven most of what's in this industry um, with issues uh, dealing with dynamic pricing, dish, uh, metered revenue, uh, financing to fund private services, removing off-street parking requirements, cashing out pay, employer paid parking, all of these concepts that many of your technologies um, are making happen really came uh, from Professor Shope, who is, um, who is the chair of the Department of Urban Planning and the director of the Institute of Transportation Studies at UCLA. 
So today he's going to talk about how parking demand has responded to variable prices uh, for on-street parking in San Francisco. Um, so please uh, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Donald Schoep. Thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to speak to you today. Um, uh, you may remember from your student days that, uh, that the professors come in two types. Uh, I don't mean the men and the women or the liberals and the conservatives. I mean the dogs and the cats. Um, the dogs run around in packs and they bark a lot and each one wants to become the top dog. Uh, but the cats are solitary. Uh, and they like to mark territory as their own so that other cats will stay out. And then among the professors of transportation planning, all the dogs chase after moving cars or they ride around in cars with their heads out the windows excited by speed. Uh, but the cats do not like riding around in cars. Um, and uh, they, they hate taking long trips in cars strapped to the roof of a car. Um, <laughs> Instead, cats inspect all of the parked cars, and they mark the tires. Um, and uh, sometimes they, they like to, to lie on the hood of a newly parked car while the engine is still warm, and they use this time to brood about the economics of parked cars. Um, um, well, cars are parked 95% of their lives, so while all the dogs were chasing after the 5% of the time that cars are moving, I thought I could learn something about the 95% of the time that cars are at rest. It's a very important time. Some of you were probably even conceived in a parked car. Um, um, I, I was uh, happy to, 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 to learn that I had been called the Yoda of urban planning until I remembered that Yoda was 800 years old. Um, and I was also flattered to be called a parking rock star, but that's not the same thing as a real rock star, I understand. That, um, but I am thinking of changing my name to Shoot Dog. <laughs> I, I'm kind of a, I'm, I'm embarrassed uh, being invited to, uh, outside of California to talk to people about uh, transportation because they think we've paved over the whole state for parking. And, and some of it has been. Here's a, a view of um, Silicon Valley. Uh, and uh, all of the cars here are, are parked for free. Um, and I think that we tend to ignore this asphalt blight in our lives if we're parked free in it. Uh, but just because the driver doesn't pay for parking uh, doesn't mean the cost goes away. Uh, somebody is paying for it, and that somebody is everybody in their roles, a taxpayer or an investor or a tenant or a shopper or some role in their lives except in their role as a driver. Um, and this, this pattern goes on for a long way um, that I think that this is bad parking policy uh, and there's no demand for technology. I, I'd say something uh, to this group that I wouldn't say to everybody, is that how much money do you think that any professional parking operator is earning from all of this parking? There's no demand for technology, there's no revenue, nobody's being employed, nobody's making money. Well, how did all of this parking get here? Well, partly it's because to, or largely is due, I think, to the profession of urban planning. Um, here is a publication from the uh, American Planning Association called Parking Standards. That sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Standards. Um, but it doesn't say anything about standards. Um, it just says how many parking require, how many cars different cities require for every kind of land use. It just reports what cities require. So that if you want to copy uh, some other city's requirement, here's the way to do it. Um, and the, uh, there are over 700 land uses that they've had to have parking requirements for. Every land use in Berkeley has a parking requirement. Because if there weren't a parking requirement, how could development go forward? Um, uh, this, this list just gets down to boarding houses, I think, at the lower right-hand term. And then here would be a page for, this is the first one, is adult land uses. Now, there are 10 adult land uses, adult bookstores, adult movie theaters, adult massage parlors and things like that. Those planners knew exactly how many parking spaces were, were um, 
uh, needed for each one. If this is the American Planning Association's vision of America in that, in that picture, they chose the picture. Uh, <laughs> this is what we're going to do. So, and then when you, each individual parking requirement makes sense taken by itself. Uh, usually they're related to the number of people, uh, although they're gender discrimination, it's hard to know why. And <laughs> they, they seem to require more than one space per person for every land use except religious land uses. And even then there's gender discrimination. But when you get away from knowing relating parking space to people, it gets a little bit harder to know what to do. And therefore, you usually relate it to the size of the, of the uh, building. But it, that doesn't work for everything, and planners have to get inventive. I mean, what would you do for a gas station or for a swimming pool? <laughs> because you have to know how many parking spaces per what. Um, and it gets very difficult. Um, so I think we've made a couple of mistakes in, in parking policy. Uh, we've kept uh, curb parking free or cheap. Um, uh, and we require lots of, of off-street parking. Here's San Ho some of San Jose's parking requirements. Uh, the green would be the size of the building, the floor area of the building, and the red would be the size of the parking lot. So for uh, most land uses, uh, San Jose requires more parking than there is building. Um, uh, well, dancing and, and skating are similar, I suppose, but they have different parking requirements. Um, uh, restaurants, uh, they always have very high parking requirements. But if you were a planner and you were asked what should be the parking requirement for an animal grooming studio, what would you do? You would never had heard of this in, in your planning education, so you would go to parking standards and see what a similar city, see what Oakland requires, and then maybe Berkeley would be able to get their parking requirement there. And when you look at the parking requirements, the tables look almost scientific. Um, it looks as though somebody has been very careful getting all of these numbers, assembling them, and it looks scientific, but it isn't. It's got nothing to, <laughs> got nothing to do with science. Every land use has a parking requirement. That's the only similarity. I think the, the similarity with parking requirements is the the 19th century science of phrenology, when, when, which was the leading theory in the, in the um, study of the brain, that they, uh, the brain scientists, I suppose, but by feeling your head, they could say, well, this fellow is very generous or selfish, or he's really interested in parking with that bump there. <laughs> but I think there, there is a big difference between phrenology and minimum parking requirements, is that phrenology didn't do any harm at all. And the parking requirements, I think, have done a terrific amount of harm on no basis because planners who set these parking requirements, they don't know how much parking spaces cost uh, um, or how the cost gets spread and how it increases the prices of other things or how it affects the way the world looks or traffic or air pollution or CO2 emissions. Those are never mentioned in setting a parking requirements. It's always well, how many parking spaces do we need? Um, uh, they, ju they just have no training, whatever. And I think the basic problem is that, that we've, the government has taken over what should be a private decision um, and has made a botch of it. So this is where I think smart parking comes in. I, I think smart parking is a combination of, of smart parking policy and smart parking technology. Um, that uh, uh, smart parking policies create the demand for smart parking technologies. The, uh, the, the program that uh, Danette told you about is a smart parking policy and it's creating the demand for what many of you sell. Uh, and, and the smart parking technologies enable cities uh, to implement the smart parking policies. The sort of things that Danette talked about wouldn't be possible without all this new technology. So I recommend, in terms of smart parking policy, uh, three basic reforms. Uh, um, the, to charge the right price for curb parking, uh, Danette talked briefly about that, which I would define as the lowest price the city can charge and still have one or two open spaces on every block. <coughs> and also have only one or two spaces open on every block. They won't be oversubscribed or undersubscribed. Um, and then uh, uh, 
The second uh, reform that I, I recommend is, to, is to how you <laughs> spend the money is that you uh, use, make this pol po po policy popular by saying, we're going to spend all of the meter money on your block. And then if you have meters, you get these new services, uh, you get to your, your sidewalk steam cleaned every month, uh, swept every night. Uh, some cities now offer Wi-Fi that come out of the parking meters. The parking meters have to communicate with City Hall, and one way to do it is Wi-Fi, but there are not that many uh, meters that are getting their credit cards uh, validated, so they have a lot of spare capacity, and the cities have decided, well, how can we use the spare capacity? Well, we open it up to everybody on the block. So people will say, I see what these meters do. I see what this smart parking technology is. Um, so that will make the, the policies, I think, politically popular. Then I think we can uh, reduce or remove the, the minimum parking requirements, and that will allow uh, what I'll come to at the end, is how do you uh, uh, restore this area that I showed you in, in Silicon Valley. Well, I think uh, for this group, the, I think the most important thing is the uh, performance-based parking prices uh, that have to adjust over time and, and uh, over space to keep about, uh, an easy way to say it is about 85% occupancy, although it's more complicated than that. Uh, another way to say it is just we want one open space on each side of the street. And SF Park and LA Express Park are two of these smart parking policies that require the latest parking technology. It's really sort of uh, created a, a demand for new technology that, that you people are responding to. Because um, you have to have meters that charge different prices at different times of day and can be remotely updated and you need occupancy sensors. Um, so, but we all have that now, and I think San Francisco has, like uh, Berkeley, has, has a grant uh, to, uh, to pay for this program, and they use their money wisely, I think. Uh, Berkeley is famous for having wonderful posters, but David Goins is his name, is that right? Well, uh, that I think if you get him to do your posters, you'd be in great shape. The, the, here's the poster showing what is wrong, that some blocks are, are over-occupied, and there's a shortage on the top, and under-occupied. Uh, on the bottom. So if we nudge the price up on the top block and nudge it down on the bottom block, we can shift one car and it would solve the problem on both blocks. Now many people seem to think that, that charging fair market prices for curb parking would be a wrenching social change that American uh, just will reject. Uh, that it would be too much to swallow, almost like the Reformation or Prohibition. But it's really a very small change, just moving one car. Can America do that? I mean, if we can't do that, what can we do? Um, and I think San Francisco also has uh, money for a wonderful uh, 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 website, uh, uh, analyses, and, and also a wonderful video that explains in less than three minutes, but it took me 800 pages to write. Some of you will have seen this, but uh, you can't see it too often. It explains what we mean about the right prices. Finding a parking space can be frustrating and time consuming. It's estimated close to a third of city traffic is caused by drivers circling while looking for a space. Some drivers just give up and double park. This clogs our streets and needlessly pollutes the air. These cars slow down public transit and get in the way of emergency vehicles. And drivers focused on finding parking create a hazard for pedestrians and cyclists. There is a better way. San Francisco is testing new parking technology and a flexible approach to pricing that is designed to make parking work better for everyone. SF Park's goal is to have at least one parking space available per block. That way drivers can park near a specific destination without the need to circle the block or double park. This also provides a steadier flow of customers for business owners. SF Park provides safer and clearer streets for everyone. Here's how it works. Newly installed parking sensors detect when a parking space is available. Drivers will be able to check parking availability and rates online, by text message, and by smartphone before heading to their destination. This will help people decide whether to drive, take public transit, bike, or walk. When people choose to drive, new SF Park meters will make paying easier. In addition to taking coins, the new meters will accept credit cards and SFMTA parking cards. 
parking time limits will be extended. Easier payment and extended time limits will help drivers avoid tickets. Prices at city-owned parking garages will be adjusted to provide an attractive alternative to meter parking. Parking rates will be adjusted based on demand, once a month, never by more than 50 cents. So, in areas where it seems nearly impossible to find a parking space, rates will increase until at least one space is available most of the time. And in areas where open parking spaces are plentiful, rates will decrease until most of the empty spaces fill, or until rates bottom out at as little as 25 cents per hour. SF Park is designed to ensure that drivers easily find an open space near their destination. SF Park will help people plan ahead, making informed decisions about the best time and the best way. Well, um, it's already, it's been operating for a year and a half now. Uh, I hope you can see it, that they, they have a wonderful website that uh, you can go and see exactly the price is at every time of day of every block. If you're heading for a neighborhood, here's a, a Fisherman's uh, Wharf in the morning and the afternoon, and you see that the prices are are much lower in the morning than the afternoon. And why is that? Well, because the occupancy was low in the morning, and they nudged it down uh, um, uh, every six weeks uh, by 25 cents. Uh, here's an article in the New York Times, uh, which is a very good illustration of what was happening here is in the Fisherman's Wharf. Um, in the 600 block of Beach Street, uh, for example, uh, and uh, on Beach Street, the initial price in August 2001 was $3 an hour, and the initial occupancy was only 37%. Uh, and just six months later, the price had decreased to $1.75 an hour. Now, the occupancy hadn't gone up as far as it should have. Why is the price still so high? Because it doesn't, it, because the price has changed very slowly. Uh, I think it, it hadn't really gotten to where it uh, needed to be. And you can see that uh, the price went down, but I was, uh, once when I was uh, presenting this to a city council, one of the council members said, and the revenue went up in both cases. That was his first reaction. <laughs> well, why did it go up? Because on Beach Street, the price fell, went down, but the occupancy went up by more. And in, in the downtown, the price went up, but the occupancy didn't decline by very much. So the price has moved in the right direction, and in these two cases, the revenue went up. And here is just a summary of what happened over the first year, and much to everybody's, people who are listening, much to people's dismay, the average price of parking in San Francisco declined in the first year by 1%. Essentially, it remained the same. So the prices went up and down on various blocks. Uh, 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 they mainly declined in the morning and increased in, in the midday and the afternoon. So the prices were adjusted according to demand without increasing prices overall. That's very important to, to tell people. They don't, the price don't just go up, they also go down. Um, and here is a, a summary of the price elasticity of demand for, for these uh, price changes, because we have over 5,000 price changes with the occupancy before and after, uh, and the average price elasticity of demand was minus 0.4, but it was higher in some areas and, uh, and lower in others, so there are seven uh, test areas. And then it also varies by the time of day. Um, it's, it turned out to be lower in the morning, and the, uh, the, the, the spaces were undersubscribed in the morning, so the prices had to go down substantially in the morning in order to get the occupancy up. Um, um, so there are certain things that would affect the, the, the uh, response, let me see. Uh, the, 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 how is the information uh, 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 distributed to people. I see that you don't see these things. Okay, well, he can, he can watch the, the screen <laughs> the way I see it. But uh, uh, the, 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 the price is very greatly in short distances. Um, so I think drivers do need information on what the price will be for it to affect their behavior. Now, I think San Francisco is the very best information of any city on how much it costs to park, because I'm sure that if you go to 
uh, the website of your city, you can't see what the price of parking is on every block. Uh, but San Francisco shows that. Uh, so, but I think more apps will come out, like Park Now, I, the other things that we, we saw out of the lobby. There's also the problem of placard abuse that um, uh, California requires cities to make parking free at meters for anybody with a disabled uh, placard. And placard abuse is just outrageous in California. It's despicable and ubiquitous, and cities are doing almost nothing to stop it. It's required by the state, and the cities are almost powerless to stop it. We all have seen disabled placard abuse. 22 UCLA football players were found with disabled placards just by accident. <laughs> so I think we have to end that problem. Um, and uh, I, the question is, that, uh, are they fair? Uh, in San Francisco, all of the uh, revenue goes to subsidize uh, public transportation, and 30% of the residents don't have cars. Uh, so I think the poorest people probably won't pay anything and they will get their transportation subsidized. Some people uh, will, will say this is unfair, but I think that it's unfair to it'll hurt poor people. But I think many people who simply don't want to pay for parking push poor people out in front of them like human shields, saying don't charge me because it'll hurt the poor. You know, they're masquerading as somebody who's very charitable, but they're being very selfish. So I think in, that this program... Will um, uh, will help the poor in, in in San Francisco. I think maybe there are a couple of things that could uh, be improved. Is that uh, refine the time periods, especially run the meters later at night. Why should they stop at 6 p.m. Uh, if this is a good idea before 6 p.m., why does it stop being a good idea at 6 p.m.? It's because the old meters couldn't um, uh, vary the length of time that was available. That you don't need turnover in the evening. Uh, you just need uh, open spaces. And, and I think uh, San Francisco now uh, just uh, uh, sets prices based on past occupancy, but I mean, if you base January's prices on December's occupancy, you're probably making the, <laughs> the, the wrong decision. That you should probably shift towards prediction, like the hockey players uh, who say they skate to where the puck will be. And I think that you ought to set prices based on what you think demand will be. So um, I think the, the, the program so far has been shown that all this is quite possible. And I think that SF Park gives uh, San Francisco the best of two worlds. It'll, if it works, um, it'll make San Francisco an even better place to be. And, uh, cities around the world will be talking about this SF Park as something we ought to do. It. Mo Montreal is already thinking about doing it. Washington, D.C. is doing something similar. Seattle, even though the pilot hasn't finished. But if it doesn't work, um, they, can, they can blame it all on a professor from Los Angeles. <laughs> so, so <laughs> they, they, they can't lose. Uh, people say this will be confusing, uh, but I mean, look at the existing signs. They're, they're not just confusing, they're threatening. <laughs> that I, I think just having uh, parking meters with uh, saying this is what the price will be, and, and uh, we have very long time uh, or no time limits, that's a lot more friendlier. Um, well, people who would think that this is impossible do think about the kind of meters that. Uh, uh, were invented in 1935 and haven't changed much since in the United States. You put your money in and you hope to get back before your time uh, uh, runs out. The people who initially opposed them said it was an infernal combination of a slot machine and an alarm clock. Uh, the, but the newer meters, I'm not endorsing anyone, this is just one uh, on the UCLA campus, can do so much more, as you know, that on these at UCLA, it doesn't tell you what the price is. It doesn't tell you the price until you touch a button or any button on the meter, and it tells you the price at that time. There are four different price schedules during the day. Um, um, and so it doesn't take much complex inf information to it. Whoops. Um, I'm dependent on my notes pages, so I'll just throw them on the floor afterwards. <laughs> uh, so uh, some of you probably suspect that professors have a lot of spare time on their hands. Um, so I set up my camera on a tripod across from one of these meters uh, and, and took a, a picture every four minutes for an hour. So there are 15 pictures. And I think this is the ideal occupancy. There are eight, eight spaces there. There's one open. So they're well used. Uh, 
and they're readily available. And you can see somebody paying at the meter. And so I just took a picture every uh, four minutes. The two cars on the end never moved. But you can see that some came and some went. Uh, usually there was one open space. Once there was none, and then another one opened up. Another four minutes goes by. You see the shadows move. Uh, once there were... Once there were three spaces, they filled up. Do you think that the parking works as well in your city as this? Can you look at any block at any time and see the kind of turnover and occupancy like that? It is well used, but it is readily available. There is no shortage of curb parking. Um, so uh, here is just a bar graph showing that most of the time there was one empty space, uh, sometimes uh, one or, or, or three, but I don't think you can, you can get any better than that. Uh, some people think that they have you know, great parking karma. They have this uncanny ability to find an open space whenever they arrive at their destination. But this will give everybody great parking karma. Um, so the, the right price for curb parking is, is almost like the uh, Supreme Court's definition of pornography. I know it when I see it. That the only way to say whether the price is too high or too low, should at UCLA, should the price have been lower than this, $3 an hour? I don't think so. Should it be higher? I don't think so. I think the price is right, uh, and the, the, the reason I say it's right is because I saw that it was right. And that's the, I'm not saying $3 an hour is the right price for park. Curb parking. I'm saying it was the right price at this hour in that place. That's all there is to it. Um, it doesn't take any any consultant to tell you uh, what should be done. Um, that you should aim for something like that. Now, why should you aim for that? One reason for that is because if you if you're underpriced and overoccupied, there'll be a lot of cruising for parking. Uh, when I was in New York recently, I took a picture. Across from the hotel I was staying in, and here, the uh, the meter was a dollar an hour, and the uh, first hour of off street parking was um, at twenty dollars an hour if you include the taxes. Um, uh, so, what would you do? Wouldn't you uh, think that uh, if you want to park for an hour and the uh, parking costs a dollar at the curb, twenty dollars an hour street? How long would you cruise for curb parking? Well, you've all done it. We've all done it. Maybe some of you did it today. Um, uh, but it's going on all over the world. Uh, and there have been studies. <laughs> the first one was 1927, appropriately in Detroit, trying to estimate how long it took to find the curb parking space or, or what share of the traffic was uh, cruising. And uh, these, were, these studies were done in places where they expected to find cruising. It was on four continents over, what, 80 years? Uh, and... Um, and uh, the average found in these studies was about 34 uh, percent. Now, this gets reported as studies have shown that a third of all the traffic <laughs> in congested areas is cruising. Well, no, that isn't. I, I don't mind that being misinterpretation. It's an easy way to say it, but that is, is what these studies have found. What does this say? Um, what does it say? I can't read it. Okay. Okay. Um, here is a study done in Chicago uh, just before uh, World War II where they uh, hired graduates or undergraduates probably to, uh, at, to stand on every corner with a, stop, with a clock and a stop, a stop a clock and, a, um, uh, and they wrote down every license pl plate number at the exact time it passed and whether it went right or straight ahead or to the left, and they were able to recreate the path of all of these cars. And you can see that some cars, like the lower left, they were fixated on one block, and other cars, you know, were more open to new experiences, and they <laughs> thought that things would be better on another block. Um, here's a study of the probability they found that... Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 
in, in New York, they uh, devised, I think, the most sensible uh, uh, way to measure cruising that can be done in any city is that they uh, interviewed drivers who were stopped at traffic lights and asked them if you were searching for parking. Uh, and on one uh, busy through street in, in, in Manhattan, 28% of the drivers were cruising. And then in a more residential area in Brooklyn, 45% of the cars said they were hunting for parking. Because, I mean, in a residential street, why would cars be driving around there so much? Why would there be much traffic on a residential street? Well, the traffic, so much of it is cruising for parking. And the, the people who are cruising for parking, they don't pay attention to pedestrians. They don't pay attention to bicyclists. If they see a, a space on the other side of the street, they'll make a U-turn in the middle of the street. Just, just on my cell phone this morning here in Berkeley, I got a sort of grainy uh, video of this, uh, this kind of behavior you can see. Well, I was able to interview the driver afterwards, and she... <laughs> and she just said, Go Berkeley! <laughs> well, I think to, to, to make these uh, parking prices uh, popular, I think uh, uh, what has worked is to... Show, be very public what you're doing with the money. It's not going into the, into the general fund. Now, that's like giving it to the UN, maybe, or the Iraq War. Um, um, but if you say we're going to spend the money in the, in the neighborhood, uh, people understand that this is a good idea. Because they, that whenever you put money in the meter, it does seem to, to effectively uh, disappear. Um, uh, but when the money stays where it's, uh, where it's collected, people understand uh, that, uh, that um, it's sensible to charge for curb parking. Some people say that charging for curb parking is un-American. Well, I think it's very American to charge people for what they use. Uh, this was during the 1984 Olympics around the uh, Los Angeles Coliseum, but it happens after every, during every event at the Coliseum. Um, they park their own cars on the street, and they charge the spectators to, to park in their driveway. It, it, it's not, it's not un-American. It's, it, it, uh, it's a very American value to charge people for what they use. Um, see, the old Pasadena was the uh, prime example of showing how this works, that it was uh, in terrible shape. I mean, Berkeley looks like just uh, uh, a new urbanist heaven compared to what uh, old Pasadena looked like. There were wonderful buildings in terrible condition, and this is what it looks like now. How did they, how did they change that? Well, um, uh, the, the city wanted to put in meters, and the uh, merchants and the uh, uh, landowners said, no way, it'll chase away our few customers we have. Of course, they all parked on the street and, uh, <laughs> and complained about the shortage of parking for customers. Um, they argued for two years and finally the city said, all right, if we put in the uh, meters, we'll spend all the money on uh, uh, public improvements in old Pasadena. And they had a vision of what the city could be like. They had hired a very good uh, planning consultant, the Arroyo Group, um, that, that showed what old Pasadena could be. It was unique if you could fix it up, if you could get rid of all the filth and uh, restore the buildings, but there was no way to pay for it. And the par parking meters were the way to pay for everything in the public sector. And the merchants, when they heard that, that that's different. You didn't tell us we'd get the money. Let's run the meters till midnight. Let's run them on Sunday. Let's charge a high price. The only difference was the city, after two years of arguing, said we'll spend all the money in old Pasadena. Uh, they borrowed something like $500,000 to rebuild all the sidewalks, all the alleys. and. Um, um, and they have a, a committee that uh, advises on how do you uh, spend the money. And Marilyn Buchanan was uh, one of the business leaders, and she's chair of the committee. And said uh, it was an easy sell. It was an easy sell only because the city said we're going to spend the money in Old Pasadena. So there was um, uh, a huge change. That the, nothing wrong with motorcycles, <laughs> but now they're, they're more Bentleys, I suppose. Uh, you can see the, the extensive restoration that had to be done. Uh, here was a tire warehouse that was empty for decades, and then it became a department store. Now it, 
It's a new department store called Forever 21, where I want to buy my clothes. Um, and, then, and then here's an alley in Old Pasadena. I mean, with dead animals and, and mattresses and things like that. Now they clean them up and they planted trees. And it's, uh, there are outdoor cafes there. Remember, this was a slum 30 years ago. Uh, so I think the parking meters with revenue return made a huge difference. So I think these parking benefit districts, they're a transportation management tool. I mean, that's why um, uh, I became interested in it, is that it would, by managing parking, it will uh, uh, have all these transportation benefits. But that's not what made it popular in the, in the in old Pasadena. That isn't what the merchants and the landowners and the uh, residents wanted. What they thought of it was a way to, to, to raise money for what they wanted to spend in their neighborhood. It had the people in Old Pasadena didn't care at all about the uh, carbon emissions or anything like that. Uh, they have to see something uh, 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 concrete as soon as they step out of their door. And the ordinances, uh, a number of cities have them now. They're very simple. Uh, these are straight from the uh, municipal legislation. They just say that the city council, instead of setting prices, it sets a vacancy rate. So this is what we want to see. And... Um, uh, uh, we eliminated our time limit. So the, the city council members, can, they just look out the window and they said, Dan Epp, this street is fully occupied all day. You're not, you're not doing your job. See, that it means that the parking manager has a responsibility. It has a goal. It has a policy goal. And the, uh, the, uh, the, it's the manager's job to achieve it by moving prices up or down. And then the third part of it is that they uh, uh, devote all the... Uh, money for uh, public services in the neighborhood. Now here's just a, a uh, thing from the uh, Downtown Business Improvement Association saying that, uh, that the, um, uh, it was overwhelmingly popular with all the merchants. So they really liked the idea. Uh, it's one of the surprising things was that they had to enforce meters if they have them, so they um, hired police interns um, uh, and were dressed like policemen and they you know, wanted to become policemen, but they uh, it's hard to get into a police department, and so they have nine of them, and just because these police interns were, were enforcing the meters, the crime rate fell by 40%, because the, the meters ran till late in the evening, and that means these people in, in uniform were on the street. And then the third thing is that they did was that they uh, uh, opened the Wi-Fi up to, to uh, all the, in the area, so the... Um, you know, the cafes and restaurants and the coffee shops that had uh, uh, paid for Wi-Fi for their customers canceled their contracts with Verizon. I said, well, you can use the, the, the parking meter uh, system. Now, well, how do, we, um, uh, how do we get from from where we are, like in Silicon Valley, to, to where we are now? Everybody's heard of this mantra, sort of, especially people in technology always say that. Well, I think parking wants to be paid for. Uh, and that we've just made a mess of things by thinking we can get it for free. Um, there, there was one of the, uh, what was it, uh, at Seinfeld, they often had parking episodes, and one where George and Lane were driving to Jerry's apartment, and George couldn't find the space. He was circling around. and. Elaine wanted to pay the parking, pay for parking in the garage, and George says, "I never pay for parking." Um, um, I think paying for parking is like going to a prostitute. Why should I pay when, if I apply myself, maybe I can get it for free? <laughs> well, we've been trying to get it for free ever since the car was invented, uh, and now is the time for the technology to take over. So how would it take over there? Um, here's this area that I'm talking about. And you can do anything with Photoshop. So I said, well, suppose we remove the off-street parking requirements and said that the Cisco Systems is the one who, that's their campus, they call it, not exactly like a university campus, um, as an automobile campus. That uh, Suppose you said that they could, uh, they, they could build housing there. Everybody in Silicon Valley said that housing is so expensive, there's not enough of it, and the long commutes and traffic congestion. Suppose we allow them to say that here's a nice area. It really is a beautiful part of town, um, but it looks <laughs> not from the air. 
So suppose we said you can build something there. Well, I took some buildings from the University of London. Uh, they'd just, had been, just been cleaned so you could see them uh, in, in the picture. And it was also the Congress for New Urbanism, Ur Urbanism, and they liked those kind of buildings, and so do I. I don't think it would be uh, uh, the, the kind of things they would build, actually, but the people who lived in these buildings could walk across the parking lot uh, to work. Uh, there would be, uh, the land is already assembled for development. There's not brownfields, anything like that. It's just ready to be built on if the city would allow it, which it doesn't. Um, and you wouldn't have to provide any parking for these buildings because the parking is already there. Um, so I uh, took some buildings from downtown uh, Los Angeles, would probably be more re realistic for this, and said, well, this is what it could look like. And if you were walking along that street, that's exactly what it would look like in downtown Los Angeles. If that worked out, they could add some more. If it kept on working out, the, here's, here's, here it is in sight is in Los Angeles. The, there's a, a daycare center on the ground floor, it's ground floor retail. and then. Uh, um, so I think that Silicon Valley could be reclaimed. It would be, as somebody said, it would be the biggest ran, land re reclamation outside the Netherlands. Um, so I think the, 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 the solutions are almost in front of us. And just think, you, the parking could no longer be free. The street parking would have to be charged for, and the off-street parking would have to be paid for. So there, the, previously, there's nothing, there's no money being made by any parking manufacturer or operator or anybody. If we put these houses in there, somebody, the, the, the drivers will have to pay for parking. Uh, the parking will become unbundled from employment and from from housing. So I think that there would be a lot of good effects that. Uh, it would create jobs. <laughs> we, we can import cars and fuel, but we can't import uh, apartment buildings. Um, uh, that it would certainly increase the housing supply and uh, uh, shorten commutes. And um, We wouldn't import so many cars and, and so much fuel, and then we'd have better air quality um, and uh, slow down climate change, especially for this group, uh, I think it would increase the demand for smart parking technology. And it would be a healthier way of living, I think, that uh, rather than having free parking everywhere, uh, that it isn't just <laughs> it isn't just parking technology people who are going to benefit. The environmentalists, uh, you know, the bicycle advocates, they're always uh, um, uh, obsessed with bicycles. So I think if you want to have achieve all of these goals, they're, they're pretty much within uh, within reach, um, um, and we could do it pretty quickly. Uh, but first, you have to get the policy right, get the price of curb parking right, and then use that, make it popular by spending the revenue uh, in the neighborhood, and then removing all street parking requirements. Now I think the political support for this comes can come from um, uh, a lot of directions, that uh, whatever your politics are, you'll see something there for you, that uh, um, uh, conservatives will see that it relies on market prices, it relies on the market, um, and environmentalists see a lot to, to, to benefit from this, and businesses will uh, see that it un unburdens their, their activities, they don't have to pay for parking for their customers. Um, and it uh, helped finance business improvement districts. Say in Pasadena, they get four hundred thousand dollars a year in the business. The business improvement district gets in parking meter revenue because the business improvement district can spend the money more efficiently than the city. They're the ones who contract for the twice a month steam cleaning of all the sidewalks, for example. Um, and new urbanists uh, will see that it will look better uh, and we can live at high density without having so many cars. Um, and libertarians, you know, that the, they're um, um, uh, a prominent group, uh, that they will, should see that this uh, uh, leaves it up to the individual uh, uh, businesses to decide. And developers have a lot to benefit from it. Uh, um, and then the residents uh, will see a lot, and neighborhood activists will say, now that we have money to spend, we have an influence on what's going to be done. Certainly the local elected officials have a lot to gain from this. Uh, they won't have to decide on the price of parking or how many parking spaces are required or anything like that. Um, and so I think we're so messed up that, that we have... A terrific opportunity. That's the upside of all the mistakes we've made. What will we do with all the cars that we uh, won't need? Here's a sculpture in France I like called Long-Term Parking. 
Uh, and then, and, and then, what about all the parking structures that we don't have? Here's a use I think you could put it to in Berkeley. I just, well, not exactly the free speech movement, but it's free something. Uh, well, I, I think you can't do better than to end with a quote from uh, Abraham Lincoln. You know, I think that our case really is new. Uh, we have new technology. We have new problems. Uh, um, and we have new ideas, uh, and it's time to, uh, 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 to adopt them. So I think that if we do this, the uh, smart parking policies will increase the demand for technology, not just the kind of technology we have now, but just uh, unimaginable new technology. Say, the technology that we have now would be unimaginable 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and then the uh, technologies will enable cities to do what they've wanted to do. Well, there is one bit of technology that General Motors is working on, and um, I don't think it'll make the operators here uh, very happy or Danette very happy, but if it does work, then I think it'll, it'll, uh, it'll solve the parking problem entirely. Here's just a, a short video of it. Well, that's about all I know, so I better stop. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you, and I look forward to hearing about the technology. Well, that was, um, that was really great. Um, and I don't know about uh, the difference between a rock star in the Wall Street Journal and a rock star. Uh, the, the common theme that I always think about rock stars is they've got groupies. And in that, uh, in that sense, you qualify, uh, you and Mick. Um, anyways, we're going to take our, um, our energy break now. And so uh, why, don't we, why don't we plan to come back in about 15 minutes at uh, 2.30. One more, t one more round of applause for uh, Danette and Dr. Schuch.